Hey everyone, in this week's video, we talk about why a professional service-based business is a great first business to start. We talk about personal finances and getting those straight, and I even show you how I hire really, really amazing talent. This video is a little bit more focused on value, so if you like this format, please let us know in the comments what you think. I'm Mike Black, and I'm giving up everything during a global pandemic. The world economy has been crippled by COVID, but with the right mindset, we can get through this. I believe right now is one of the best times to reinvent yourself, and so I'm putting everything on the line to prove it. This is the million dollar comeback. You have to just put stuff out there. <laughs> it's starting to really hit me. I don't know what else to tell you. Just a lot more work to do. You know what I love about this? I can say whatever I want and it turns out good. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Because of you. <laughs> All right. Ready? So in the last video, I was trying to figure out which business to start. I have 30 bucks in my bank account right now, so it's, uh, it's a little crazy. I thought I was gonna start a TikTok agency, but unfortunately that fell through. So instead, I decided to start an e-commerce marketing agency. We got this now, baby, so now it's time to put this thing to work. I kind of give an overview of my plan of attack for starting my agency, but I didn't go into much detail. This isn't rocket science, right? Like, there's the business and there's the fulfillment. If you're that person, go find the business person that can actually grow your business. So over the last week, I spent a lot of time interviewing people, and I want to show you exactly how I do that. But before we do that, I want to explain the business model of starting an agency and why an agency is a great first business to start. A service business is a great business to start because of cash flow. You can start the business with very, very little money and start making a lot of cash up front. So what I want to do is explain the business model and explain the first four steps in starting your service business. Now there's a lot more that goes into this, but here's the first four steps that I'm taking. Step number one is pick a niche. It's really important to really, really niche down with whatever service you're starting. It's important not to just be a marketing agency that can do everything. You want to be the marketing agency for e-commerce or the video production company for real estate. That's one way to niche down. Another way to niche down is niche down very technically within a business. For example, the TikTok agency. That is one specific technical part of marketing. Another example, in software development, there's a bunch of different languages. You could pick one language, like iOS development, and just be the iOS development agency, and that's all you do. All we do is iOS development, we don't do anything else. We're the best at iOS development. Now the reason this is important is number one, you can get in front of people really easy. You know exactly who to get in front of and who to pitch. And number two, you're gonna convert much higher because people will see you as the expert in that specific field and they'll be willing to pay a premium, which means you'll also have higher profit margin. So the first thing is niching down. For me, I went with the e-commerce marketing agency. Step number two is to get really good mentors. Mentors that run the same type of business that you do. I'm going to get marketing agency mentors that run six-figure, seven-figure, and eight-figure marketing agencies. You also want to get technical mentors. And when I say technical, I mean people that are experts in something specific, like hiring, sales, marketing. I need to learn Facebook ads and doing Amazon, so I want to get mentors that are really good at those things. They'll be able to help me navigate through the technical side of the business I'm building, as well as potentially validate if the people I'm hiring are actually good hires. The third step is hiring talent, and we're looking at both freelancers and agencies. Now, here's how this business model works. We go and we find talent. We leverage their portfolio to go and close deals with clients, and they do the actual work. So the way this works is I pay a Facebook marketer, let's say $50 an hour, and I bill the client $80 an hour. I sign a contract with that client, they pay me 80 bucks, I make 30 bucks, and I send 50 over to the contractor. That's the first way to do it. The second way is to do a retainer. So maybe I pay this person $1,000 a month, I bill the client $2,000 a month, and I make $1,000. And the last way are called fixed projects, where maybe I pay the freelancer $5,000 on a fixed rate, and I charge the client $10,000, and I make $5,000. 
Now, what's great about this is we can, again, leverage their portfolio, leverage their experience, and use that to close deals and bring in new business. The fourth and final thing that I'm doing currently, again, there's a lot more to this, but the fourth thing that I'm doing next is building credibility. It's really important to build credibility as quickly as possible. And the way you do this is by putting out really good content and doing things like starting a podcast. So I'm starting an e-commerce podcast where I'm gonna be interviewing industry experts. Now the reason this is great is number one, I get to build relationships with really, really cool people. Number two, I frame myself as an expert in the industry. And number three, people are consuming that content and it's bringing them in as potential leads. So those are the four first steps that I'm taking to get my agency off the ground. That's kind of the overarching business model of everything. There's a lot more that's gonna go into it, but we're gonna cover that as we do more and more videos. So back to this week, my finances are not well. I am really struggling financially. I have very, very, very little money in my bank account. Flipping couches just is not enough. Um, I'm not able to consistently make money and like be able to pay bills. And on August 10th, I have a lot of bills that are coming up. Happy Monday, everyone. Have an amazing week. It's time to get to it. So today I realized that part of the rules is that on August 10th, the 10th of every month, I owe $100 for phone and $100 for um, health insurance. Um, so I realized I really, 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 really need to make some money. Sick of being broke. I started looking at different things and I found a site called shiftsmart.com. I've worked 30 minutes, so I've made five bucks. <laughs> Still grinding over here. It's a website where you can find these freelance gigs doing things like telemarketing. It pays $10 an hour and you pick which time slots that you wanna work. All you need is a computer, a headset, and that's it. I interviewed, I got the job. It was super easy. Like if you have a pulse, they'll give you a job. Um, and <laughs> And the job that I got was a telemarketing role doing political surveying. <laughs> Holy sh! I, I like, I don't even know what I'm saying. I literally don't know what I'm doing. Now, in last week's video, you may have seen that I went and got a new computer. Who is that thing? Crooked? Yeah, it's a total piece of garbage. <laughs> the real reason I got that computer is the software for Shift Smart only works on Windows or Mac. Now that I had the Dell computer, I was able to start taking shifts. It was. Interesting to say the least. No one's answering. It's not even ringing. I've just been sitting here like a, an idiot, just dialing. My first shift was four hours. I cold called people for four hours and I made hundreds of calls. Hello, my name is Mike Black. May I speak to... Hello, my name is Mike Black. May I please speak to... This is Mike Black. May I please speak to... Oh, sorry about that. Have a good day. <laughs> During the four hour shift, I only got one survey filled out. Now that survey took about 22 minutes to fill. There was another person that got 20 minutes in and then dropped off the call because they got so angry. <laughs> They're on the call for 20 minutes and it still wasn't finished. And in the training, they teach you to, <laughs> to keep telling them like, hey, we're almost done. <laughs> she was not happy. She finally hung up on me. <laughs> Yeah, this job was. <laughs> this what were you job, ask I was at. It was like political surveying, so like I was asking them questions like, "What about Donald Trump? Would you say very favorable, somewhat favorable, neutral, somewhat unfavorable, or very unfavorable?" People were getting pissed off, but it was like this company doing it, not me. <laughs> so it was just, it was interesting. All right, just finished my first shift of political surveying. It was the most boring thing I've ever done. It was kind of fun though. Kind of like screwed around a little, so. That was cool. That is the first time I've ever worked for someone else in, I wanna say like five or six years. But that's what happens when you don't close deals. The one thing that really sucks about Shift Smart is the shifts are only four and five hour shifts at a time. You can't work like a 10 hour day. And personally, I wanna work as many hours as possible so I can make as much money as possible. And it's important to maximize the amount that I make per hour so I can spend the most amount of time building and growing my business that I'm trying to start. So that's what we're up to. We're making good progress in the business though. I have a meeting on Thursday with the person I'm gonna be working with. Hopefully we can land our first deal pretty soon. So if you're starting a business, it's really important to figure out your finances, figure out where you could reduce costs so you can spend the most amount of time on your business. Here's the breakdown. The biggest expense people typically have is things like rent, mortgage, and car payments. If you can reduce those things, live in a dumpier place, downsize, you can save a lot of money, you can take that money and go put it into your business. Um, this is something I've done my entire life. When I was first working at my startups, 
uh, Mapify and Parking Bee. We worked out of a basement. We ate ramen noodles every day. We ate freaking dirt. It feels like you and your, your former co-owners were living that bean life. Oh yeah, we were living bean life. We were totally living <laughs> totally bean. Dude, bean life. You know what? <laughs> you know what's funny? You wanna talk about bean life? They used to call it horse feet. Literally take spaghetti with no sauce on it. I would take a bunch of vegetables, put it in there, and I would like cook up chicken and cut it up and put it in there. And uh, that bucket was my food for the day. <laughs> so I had 30 buckets that I would meal prep once a, <laughs> once a month. Cost me close to nothing to actually eat. That's what we did. That's what we did so we could spend more time on the business and the least amount of money possible on food. Hashtag bean life. <laughs> in total, we come out to $1,000 a month. It's actually a little bit less. The reason I'm doing that is like if I do increase my rent uh, payment, if I move somewhere else, then like this is kind of what it will look like. So now I know how much money I need to make to survive. So I need to work, again, at Shift Smart 100 hours a month and then all of the rest of the time I can spend working on and building my business. People have been saying it, we have to get, start telling people to hit the like button, but like where the f do we do that? Do we do it at the end? I feel like it'd be better in the middle. Hit the f***ing like button, hit the subscribe button. <laughs> He's got like $5 in his account right now. <laughs> if, if you could just please hit the like button and subscribe button, I only have five bucks, please. <laughs> so if you remember earlier, we talked about hiring the technical part of the business and I am the business operator. So now I need to hire that technical person to run the marketing side of my business because I don't know anything about running Facebook ads or Amazon marketing. So what I wanna do now is show you exactly how I went about hiring someone to run that side of my agency. Hey, so in this video, I wanna show you exactly how I go about hiring people, what my interviewing process looks like, and I wanna break it all down. So this site is called Upwork.com. Upwork is a site to hire freelancers and to also find jobs as a freelancer. I was looking for a senior Facebook ads manager, someone that spent over a million dollars in ads um, in the last year. So I just made it really straightforward. We're an e-commerce marketing company looking to hire someone who has spent at least a million dollar in ad spend on Facebook and Instagram marketing. Please only apply if you spend at least a million dollars. Now you gotta put things like that on Upwork because there's so much just garbage that's gonna come through um, of people applying that just totally don't meet the job criteria. Um, so I have another line of defense. I also ask questions here. This is the first thing I really read. So I said, how much budget have you managed on Facebook, Insta in the last two years? Now this number needs to be like two plus million dollars. If it wasn't, then I didn't interview the person. Uh, what is the highest ad budget you manage for an e-com company? Again, right here, my assumption is if you manage a lot of money for e-com companies, um, or just on Facebook and Insta in general, then you probably know what you're doing. Um, so that was my approach to this. Usually I don't make job postings this short. I'll show you what my typical job postings look, but look like, but I was really rushed for time. I want to show you some profiles and how I review them. So I'll go over to, to this other job where I did Amazon pay-per-click and Amazon account management. Um, so here's how I go about reviewing people in Upwork. The first thing is I like to look at their title. This guy, Amazon PPC expert. He probably does a lot of Amazon stuff. He has a good success score here. So I'll click on him and I'll look at the cover letter. So again, these, this is a question that I asked. So th this is like the first thing I look at. Why are you the best fit for this role? Six years working with Amazon. Okay, great. How much budget have you managed? I don't love this answer. I understand why he gave this answer, but I think on the call that I had with him, I validated that he has managed a lot of budget. Next, I go and look at their work history, which is super cool because I can like see all this stuff, Amazon, 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 and he claims he's been doing it since like 2014. So let me go try to find this person's LinkedIn real quick. Okay, cool. So I was able to find this person's LinkedIn. Now, th this is weird because I'm hiring someone for like Amazon, which is like pretty easy to do um, in terms of like, there's a lot of stuff you can fake. If you were hiring, say, a developer, you can't fake as many things, I guess, because typically developers worked at companies like, say, Facebook or Google or um, like another development agency. So people can't really fake um, certain things. Now here, if you look at this LinkedIn, a lot of this stuff can be faked because it's his own company, it looks like, or a company he works for. Um, a lot of these things could be faked if they're grayed out like this. Let me just click on a random profile. Oh, here's another person that I interviewed. Okay, what can't be faked is actual companies. I mean, it could, but like typically people don't do that because then the company would reach out and say you, that they lied. So I like to see, okay, this per person was an intern, intern, and then 
he graduated in 2013, so that means he's been working since 2013 professionally. Okay, so he was a senior ops engineer, then a business dev associate. Now, if I was hiring a developer, you know what, f this, let's go look at a developer. Okay, so let me show you what like someone that's more junior looks like versus someone that's maybe more senior. If you look at this person, they say they're like a software developer, they have all this stuff that they're putting in their profile, and then you go and look at their actual experience and you see this person was a social media intern and then a score reporting an analyst. And then you look down and go, oh, this person just graduated from an app academy, but they can do all these things. So like someone like this is like very clearly, very, very, very clearly, very junior. I'm looking for someone with experience, like someone that's really been doing this for a long time. Here's another person, his name's Maxim. Um, he worked as a Java developer for five, almost six years at this Netcracker. That means he probably is a really good Java developer. Then I can see he worked for another four years as a Ruby on Rails developer at Castle Digital Partners. Okay, this person is probably a really senior backend engineer. Um, then he also is now working as a freelancer at Toptal. He is definitely a good Ruby on Rails engineer. So that's how you can like really quickly like get an idea if someone's actually good is like just go to their LinkedIn. If someone doesn't have a LinkedIn, that's typically not a good sign. Um, I've found almost always with past experience. You want to be smart about how you approach this. If you're hiring someone that's a senior level person, you want to see lead developer or senior developer or that they've done something for a very long time. Like this person, Maxim, I can see he's been coding for like, man, like 10 years, 12 years. He definitely has experience developing and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for someone with a lot of experience in this case scenario. So if this guy uh, applied at Told Media as a Ruby on Rails developer, I would definitely give this guy an interview. Now, this person, I'm interviewing them and just getting to know them. What have they done? Learning more about the business. Can you just give me like the quick like 30 second elevator pitch? The services that you offer right now, like what exactly does it look like? Is it like actually like taking over the account, doing like the product description, strategy, and then like the pay-per-click? What I'm most interested in like learning more about is like the exact service offerings. Do you know how much budget you've managed over the last year? The clients you work with, is there a target um, like average cart size? This is an important uh, question I always ask. What would your client say about you when I do reference checks? And you can do this with people that worked at previous jobs. When I talk to your previous boss, what is he gonna say about you when I do my reference checks? And then people are like, oh shit, I can't lie. Um, so that's a little trick that I use. I forget where I learned that, but that's how I kind of go about like vetting people. If I don't have the expertise, a lot of times I'll find someone who does to help me do the technical interviews. And you can either pay someone to do that or you can find a, what I call a technical mentor to help you do that. Here's a look at other places that we post jobs and I'm gonna use Million Dollar Comeback as an example. So right now we're hiring for a lot of roles at Million Dollar Comeback. We're looking for someone to join our social media team and our team in Austin, Texas. Um, so here's a job post that we just put up. This is what it looks like. Um, are you looking for a leadership experience, blah, blah, blah. And then at the bottom we put like what million dollar comeback is. And this is really important. I always use a Google form. The only place I don't use a Google form is on uh, Upwork. And the reason for that is when people fill all this stuff out, I don't want them to just fill this out. I want them to follow the directions that says, if you're interested in working with us, please fill out this application, bam, form. And then I click here and I can manage everything in a Google sheet because the form is a Google form. This is actually a different job that we have um, that we originally had for our lead videographer role. Um, and I asked for things like email, name, uh, LinkedIn. If they don't fill out their LinkedIn, I don't interview them. I don't even look at their their uh, their resume. Um, are you based in Austin? What's your salary or hourly rate? I just ask all these questions. Pay, and this is important. I wanna see their portfolio. This is the first thing I go to. Paste the link to your last video. Paste the link to your favorite video. What type of gear do you have? Like, just think about like, what are the important questions I need to know about the person and ask those questions. When they fill this out, again, the responses go here. And then what I do, you can see a lot of red and green. Um, I just go through their portfolio. I click on this video. I watch it. If I don't like them, I will mark all this in red. If I do like them, I will mark it in green. Now you can see this is really great because I can just go in here and I can scroll through and I can see everything that I want to see about the person and then I can figure out if that person deserves an interview or not. 
makes it very simple. The other place is Indeed. Now LinkedIn costs money, Indeed is free. Now you can see my hiring strategy off of Upwork is a lot different, but this, the, the, the same key thing matters is when you are going to interview people throughout your interviewing process is that you are asking very key questions where you can quickly look at something or click a video or whatever it is that you can validate if you wanna work with that person or not. Now, that's the first step in the hiring process. We put the, the, the job app out and create your listing and your whole workflow like this. The second step is to review everything. The third step is to invite them to an interview and interview them and figure out they're gonna be a good fit. And the fourth and final step is to give them some form of a test. It's really, really, really important to give someone a, some form of a test. Um, actions speak louder than words. So let me show you a test that we gave to um, someone on our overseas team. Okay, so here's an example assignment we gave for a graphic designer for Toll Media. Um, pretty much we explained the role, they had 10 hours to complete it, it was a paid assignment, and it was very, very straightforward what they had to do, they had to make some designs and then submit it. So here are the designs they had to do, task one, they had to make video, YouTube video design assets, we explain it here. Then the second task was YouTube thumbnail, and then the third task was they had to create podcast cover art. So then, after they were done, they turned everything in, they billed their hours, so we could see like, we and compare like, okay, this person took this long and this person was really good at communicating or they're really bad at communicating. So we were to validate people that were actually like, not just good at design, but were they communicating? Were they problem solving? Like, what else are they good at? Again, you don't know how good someone is until you work with them, so it's super important to give an assignment. So that's all for this video. I hope this helped you with hiring. So I hope you learned a bit from that video. Those interviews went so well. I met so many amazing people that are really, really smart, and now it makes me a lot more confident going in and pitching new business. I literally learned almost everything that I really need to learn to get off the ground, almost as much as going out and getting a mentor. So the quick tip here is when you're doing these interviews, ask questions around running the business because they know what services work and they know what to upsell, so ask those questions. Okay guys, so here's where we're at. I found the talent, I found really good people to help me grow the e-commerce marketing agency, but my finances are really, really bad. At the time of recording this, August 7th, I have $4.54 in my bank account. I owe $200 for phone and health insurance, and I owe Isaac $250 for rent. Now, the problem with ShiftSmart is there's just not enough shifts available to actually make all of that. So a couple nights ago, I got really fed up and I decided to take matters in my own hands. So I went on a site called Upwork.com and I started applying to as many freelance roles as I possibly could. I applied to 10 different jobs in one night and the next day I woke up and I had three interviews. One of those jobs that I had an interview for paid $25 an hour working for a law firm as a virtual assistant. The interview went really well and I was able to get the job. Now I can put a lot more attention into getting the business off the ground, growing, getting sales. Now Brock, no more flipping couches. No more couches! <laughs> Hey, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this week's video. If you did, hit the like button. It really helps us out. And if you never wanna miss an update, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Also, if you wanna check out this week's comeback challenge, go to mikeblack.co slash comeback challenge week four. <laughs> that ending didn't go well, Brock will fix it. I don't have to worry about it. I said some stupid, Brock will fix it. Or he'll make me look like an asshole, either or. <laughs> He's looking like an <laughs> That's usually the case.